Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Maradian here at the West 2018 Conference and Trade Show, the largest uh, maritime conference and trade show on the West Coast of the United States, a joint endeavor between AFSIA International and the United States Naval Institute, and we're honored to have with us the President and CEO of Huntington Ingalls Industries, uh, Mike Petters, uh, who uh, has always been generous with his time. Mike, great seeing you again. Good to see you again, Vago. It's uh, been a great show here for a couple of days. Uh, that's right. You're one of the CEOs who's been here uh, the whole time. You are the largest shipbuilder uh, in the United States. Uh, talk to us a little bit about, you know, we've heard all of these messages from Pat Shanahan. Uh, you and I spoke when we were at the Reagan Forum. You know, there is this focus, uh, you know, new fo you know, there was a focus on innovation in the last administration, but this administration is kicking that forward, looking at doing everything it can to accelerate acquisition, to try to cut the cost of programs. There's congressional legislation that's supporting it. Um, uh, Hondo Gertz, the Undersecretary for, uh, excuse me, Assistant Secretary for Acquisition uh, uh, in, in the Navy, talked about uh, cost reduction, for example, on John Kennedy uh, that's in the yard, the next Ford class carrier. Talk to us a little bit about what you guys are doing to drive innovation forward, to try to take costs out of the program. And I've got a couple of more nuanced, granular questions to ask you in that okay. process. Well, first of all, uh, I think if you start with the national security strategy, what, what I see in all of that is that the, the demand for speed. You know, there just has to be, things have to go faster. And that, that is from the development of technologies to the implementation of, of technologies into products to even your business practices in the, in the background. Everything we're doing, we have to do it faster. The cycle that we, we've been living under for a while is, a, is now a, a disadvantage for us. And so that to me is, is a, a, a really big point that I've gotten out of this, uh, uh, this changeover in the administration. The, this this uh, this group is really focused on speed, and so from our standpoint, we welcome that. We relish that. Uh, we we put our track shoes on every morning. We're we're very interested in investing in the business. We've been uh, for the past couple of years, we've been investing in our core shipbuilding business in a very pretty robust way. Uh, the shipyard of the future at Ingalls. Uh, the new facilities at Newport News for the Columbia class and for um, uh, taking cost out of the Ford class. You know, as an example, we, we took the Ford itself and we captured the production improvements we could make. We invested against those production improvements to the tune of a couple hundred million dollars. Uh, and we reduced the acquisition cost by nearly a billion. So, you know, those kinds of things we think are going to help us go faster. Uh, and we're pretty excited that there's actually going to be some receptivity to those ideas and say, this is something that we could do together that actually would be would increase the speed. Uh, do you and, um, you know, I asked uh, Hondo this question about, you know, does he need to meet with all of you guys together to sort of rethink what requirements should be like, what approaches should be like, to build future ships faster and cheaper. You know, there are a whole series of requirements we have. Uh, you know, you went to the Naval Academy, you were a uh, qualified submariner, um, and you know, some of these requirements date from the earliest days of nuclear power. Some of the requirements date, date from World War II in terms of shipbuilding requirements for shock, concussion, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, you know, when Admiral Richardson was at nuclear reactors, he tried to work to uh, drive change uh, there. Uh, some of it was well received by the more legacy staff, others others uh, uh, less so. But talk to us a little bit about, you know, do you guys as the shipbuilders need to have a conference, sit down with the Navy and sort of really go through sort of the big nav -C binder of what are the things we ought to be doing? What are the things that we can do differently? What are process changes we can make in order to be able to drive greater efficiency into future classes of ships? Well, I, first of all, let me just say change is always hard. And it doesn't matter where you are, when you're trying to change things, get people to do something differently today than they were doing it yesterday, you're going to have a group of people who will be excited about that. You're going to have a group of people that are going to feel threatened by that. And the challenge for leadership is to bring everybody together, not just the ones that are excited. Um, so every change leader, and, and I think that where we are in the 21st century is if you are a leader, you are a change leader. And if you're, if you're not good at being a change leader, you probably won't last as a leader. Um, as far as the, the how do, you, do we bring all the shipyards together, I, I mean, maybe, but I, th I think, a, I, I guess it would be interesting to see if we talk about speed, let's, let's actually have a discussion about requirements. And, and where the shipyards and the businesses and the, corp and the industry can step in and say, Look, here are some here are some uh, business practice requirements that are slowing us down, you know, and they're and they're 
they're there for a reason. You know, whenever somebody stubs their toe, we make a new rule that says that nobody's ever going to be allowed to stub their toe again, and we all have to live like that. Maybe we can take, in the interest of speed, maybe we can take some of that uh, risk again. You know, we can get back to, you know, if one person stubs a toe, then we'll just go deal with that one person instead of trying to do a, a you know, blanket rule that solves all the problems. But the other side of it is how do you how do you manage the 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 interface between the industry and the warfighter with regard to the requirements that you have, and what can you effectively field, and how fast can you effectively do that? So I think it's a lot bigger. When I when I think of requirements, a lot of, a lot of people talk about requirements as what does a warfighter need. I think a requirements is a lot bigger than that. I mean, it is what the warfighter needs, but it is also business practice. It's the back office, it's the, you know, the logistic support. And, and what are the requirements going to be for that? How many audits are you going to do? How many inspections are you going to do? How much in quality process inspection are you going to do? How much, how much trust is there going to be between the, 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 you know, the Pentagon and the industry? That, that's part of the requirements equation. Certainly, if uh, if the if uh, Secretary Gertz wanted to pull us all together, we would certainly participate in that, and we would offer our our ideas on how you could streamline the process. I just think that's a small small part of it. Um, he he indicated that he would be uh, more. Uh, uh, he he's looking forward to talking to each and every single one of you uh, independently. Right. Um, let me take you though about stubbing the toe. I mean, what are some of the stubbing the toe things that you would? change? Um, you know, what are the things that you would recommend uh, that the Navy do differently and, and a sentiment that would be shared by your fellow shipbuilder? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we have a constant dialogue with the, with the Navy over the different ways that we do things, but I think it runs the gamut from how, how do we qualify certain materials or certain things on the ship to how do, what kind of audit processes or transactional processes do we need to have oversight? And where do you, and where do you do the in you know the in process quality checks? And how do you do that in such a way that allows us to go faster? Um, certainly don't want to see any reduction in quality or take any more um, challenges that you might see out there. But how do we rebalance the risk reward um, uh, piece? You know where the reward would be speed. And so. Uh, you know, we have a dialogue with the Navy, and I'm I'm just really encouraged that um, the new leadership in the building seems to think that that's an important uh, aspect of what we need to do, and so maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll make some headway in that regard. What do you What do you um, What's what, What's the role of uh, automation, robotics, new technology? You know, we we saw the Beamer folks, uh, the battle space exploitation for mixed reality. How you can use uh, very, very inexpensive tools in order to get big payoff. Laser mapping of compartments and facilities. Hondo talked about taking costs out, and you and I have talked about, you know, getting away from from paper uh, diagrams and plans and blueprints when it comes to either for for build or for uh, you know upgrade and, and repair. Talk to us a little bit about the role of of automation and this new technology in the future. We're going to whether it's for new build, whether it's for uh, ship repair. Yeah, I mean, I think we're at the front edge of some of the most interesting and changes you're going to see. Um, whether it's in automation or uh, analytics um, or something uh, like additive manufacturing. I think all of those things are going to be brought to bear in different parts of our business uh, that you know, we're going to have to, we're going to have to go down this path with our customers together because it's going to make a lot of people uncomfortable. Uh, the good thing is that we're in the, you know, we're uh, it appears anyway on the front end of several new programs that are getting ready to kick off or, or continuation of programs. You know, the new carrier, the next block of submarines, the Columbia class, the Flight 3 destroyers, the LXR amphibs. I mean, you, you go through that and you say, um, we can actually be more efficient and we can redeploy workforce in such a way that it addresses our human capital challenges that we might have as we were trying to expand. And so this is actually a really good time for us to be considering all of those things. Uh, whether you talk about bringing those things to bear in the capability of the ship, or in the process of building the ship, or even just something as simple as training the workforce, they're going to have tremendous impact. Uh, you mentioned Flight 3, so I should ask you about that because that RFP is uh, now out and on the street uh, as one of the people who's going to be competing for that contract. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you're going to be uh, interested in competing yeah, for that we're, contract. We're, we're interested in that program, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I know certainly that's music to the folks in Pascagoula's ears, but 
Talk to us a little bit about the RFP insofar as you can talk about it. You know, are you satisfied you know, in terms of you know, clarity of requirements, the approach the service is taking? Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, I mean, it just came out today, so um, we'll probably have a lot more to say about it down the road. But you know, we work pretty closely with the Navy to make sure that uh, we understand what they're trying to do, uh, make sure that we understand what their intent is, and then we want to make sure there's alignment between what they're asking for and what they intend. You know, and, and sometimes in the past there's been some discrepancy, there's a gap between, you know, we care about schedule but we're going to compete on cost or something like that. My sense of this at this point, early into it, is that uh, they're pretty consistent. They're telling us how they want, what kind of a competition they want to have and the RFP seems to reflect that. So, you know, we're excited about the competition, looking forward to it. Um, let me ask you uh, two CEO questions uh, because uh, your job is uh, managing resources for an $8 billion uh, dollar, uh, company. Uh, Wall Street uh, has had a nice run and defense stocks have gone up with that, your, your, your stock included in, in that uh, group. Um, but you know, we, we had a little bit of a market correction. Uh, more broadly, from a capital attraction and, and, and uh, capital attraction standpoint, do you face any challenges because sort of a perception on Wall Street is, you know, this this is just, you know, great times, particularly if you're, you know, a defense contractor. Is there any challenge from your standpoint about attracting and keeping that 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 money over and, and attracting them to the HII corner? Well, I'm going to say this is an answer that you're going to hear to a lot of questions. It's all about the budget. It, you know, every time that uh, our political system looks like it's incapable of kind of resolving and doing normal stuff, it creates uncertainty. And the one thing that capital markets don't like is uncertainty. And so if it looks like we have a path and that we're moving forward, then everybody's all in and we're ready to go invest. Uh, if it looks like that maybe we can't get there from here, uh, that creates uncertainty and that causes some, some volatility. And, and I think that's really what a, a lot of what you've been seeing over, over a while. I mean, I, I certainly am not a prognosticator of the stock market. Our view is really, let's focus on what we do. The market will take care of itself. Uh, if we are looking to create value in our business every day, improve the value of our business, make it more valuable, if every member of our company is doing that, then our value on Wall Street will reflect that. And so that's where we really focus our attention. We don't, we don't get too caught up in the, uh, uh, the gyrations that are out there that are not driven by anything that we're doing. They're driven by external factors. Uh, the um, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, so you know, on the upside, as we saw at the end of last year, was the tax package that changed the tax rates on companies. You, you and I spoke about that uh, at the Reagan Forum. But uh, Secretary, uh, Deputy Secretary Shanahan, when he was talking on Monday, uh, there was a safe dropping analogy that he made regarding uh, cyber and the fact that everybody's got to sharpen their cyber game. Uh, everybody has got to get much more engaged, and the expectation that companies, large companies are going to become perhaps better stewards, at least is a message that I carried from that, uh, of their subcontractors, cyber vulnerabilities. And uh, what, from, as the standpoint of a CEO with thousands, if not tens of thousands of suppliers, how does that change your dynamic? How does it change your cost structure? What's the right way to implement and institute that as opposed to becoming a prime contractor who's now suddenly responsible for the cyber inadequacies, perhaps, of a, of a very, very vast supplier base. And in your case, you have guys who are technologically very sophisticated but may not have a lot of computers necessarily in their uh, operation. Well, I, I think, um, you know, we have 5,000 suppliers across our business. And, you know, and they run the gamut from fairly, fairly simple, small, businesses that may only have three to five people running their operation to large corporations. Um, this I think is one of those great uh, thought experiments that we've got to go figure out is there, there probably is, as, as, as the secretary pointed out, there's probably a hard line requirement out there around cyber that we've got to go figure out. Now, okay, if that's what the requirement is, that's an operational requirement but there's also got to be a business requirement. How do we manage the business requirements? And the point he made was, you know, if he turned around and put that hard line requirement on us tonight, tomorrow morning, and said, you have to sign up that every one of your suppliers can meet these requirements, I don't know anybody that could, you know? And, and so, what's the path? What's the path in the business process that's going to support the operational requirement? And recognize that these kinds of requirements, you know, they create they create opportunities, they, they are critical to us, but they also create 
uh, cost and sometimes they slow us down. So I think it's going to be a, you know, very interesting to watch this one play itself out. My own view is let's be really clear about what we're trying to do. Let's be very clear about uh, what the level of accountability is and then that gives us the opportunity to engage with our suppliers to say here's what we need you to do, here's how we can support you, um, here's how, but this is what we're going to have to get from you so that we can do what the Pentagon needs us to do. I don't think that's an overnight process. It takes a little bit of time. We uh, met uh, America when she came back uh, from her first deployment. Uh, obviously, she had the big long trek over to the West Coast where, you know, it, it was a mini sort of UNITAS as she went over there uh, across South America in 2015. But this was the first full up uh, deployment. Uh, Tripoli is now in build, the second of the ship, and you're already now uh, massing stuff to build uh, Bougainville, which is going to be uh, a return to the well deck uh, ship. Um, talk to us a little bit about the lessons learned, what you're seeing from America that you guys are incorporating into Tripoli, uh, and, and more importantly, how you're swinging back without cost perturbation to get back to a well deck design, which again, uh, anytime you have a fresh opportunity to redesign it, the Marine Corps has kind of taken the opportunity to say, hey, hang on, you know, if we're going to do this, let's, let's do a couple of other things differently. Talk to us about you know, how you're going through that process to end up without any more cost, which is what you know, the, yeah, I mean, the customers that's, focus that's on. probably the most complicated thing that we do is when we are building something again for the first time. And so uh, we, we and the Navy worked really hard to make sure that the, uh, the Tripoli looks a, a lot like America. We, I mean, we, we made it a really strong point that they are the same ship. And then we had pretty senior involvement in anything that we brought in that was going to make a change between you know, America and Tripoli. Um, we are doing that with, uh, with the uh, design package for you know, LHA-8. To, when you start talking about the new well deck, I mean, it is, it is a space that's going to have new design, but, but it's new design that we've actually built before. And so, how, you know, we're, just, we're integrating that in a way. We, we developed a lot of tools to help us deal with lead ship uh, construction, especially in Pascagoula over the last uh, 15 years. And so we still have those, and, and we will, you know, I, I'm pretty comfortable that we're in a good place on that ship right now. It's still pretty early, but I think we're in pretty good shape. Uh, do you have a marketing challenge when it comes to the frigate competition? Um, there has a lot of been a lot of discussion where you know certainly the two LCS the littoral combat ship contractors are making the case to the Navy, hey, look, you have two hot running production lines. Each one of them is building two ships a year. I mean, it's astonishing that there are a ton of these ships that are already out there. I mean, LCS twelve is uh, in service. The USS Omaha was just uh, uh, just commissioned uh, last week, uh, last weekend uh, here uh, on Broadway Pier in in San Diego. Uh, but there's less discussion sometimes of the frigate variant of the national security cutter, which you're producing successfully for the for the United States Coast Guard. Um, do you think that that ship is is getting the visit? and the profile and the consideration that certainly you guys believe it does as all the conversation tends to focus on overseas frigate designs or um, you know the two LCSs that are already in production as if sort of this national security cutter ship that's actually in use with an American armed force is is somewhat less of a conversation item well I think it just depends on the lens that you use for you know what's the requirement and then how can you demonstrate whether you can meet that requirement or not I mean every every single competition not just the frigate competition but every competition you start out with some kind of marketing challenge because you know we will assert what we think we can do um, other companies will assert what they can do and then we will also assert why what we can do is better than what they can do and all of that gets into the mix and becomes part of the part of the challenge of of winning these competitions it's why we love the sport um, so I, I don't see it as being any different than any other competition uh, what's really unique about the frigate competition in general was the Navy's decision that, that we want to use a parent design that is actually very refreshing I mean that's very consistent with we're interested in speed and so, okay, we have parent designs out there. Given the parent designs, we can go look at the parents and see how they're performing. Uh, and I have confidence that uh, the performance of the platforms that are out there are going to speak for themselves. And so, you know, this will play out and, uh, and we look forward to it. Mike, thanks very much. It's always a real pleasure talking to you, sir. And looking forward to seeing you in, in sunny Newport News. Oh, come see us sometime. We'll be happy to have you.